Hey fellow worshipers, it's Rebecca. Welcome back to another episode of Lyric and Letter. And I'm so thrilled to have you here with me today, as always. Now, if you're new to this podcast, our mission here is simple but profound. We go deep into worship songs, unravel the scripture that resonate with them, and explore how these divine melodies tug at our hearts and become our faith anthem. Now, today comes with a mature audience's only warning, but don't worry, it's not what you think. We're not about to dive into anything inappropriate. Instead, we're going to dive into some deep and spiritually mature themes that require us to stretch our understanding and grow in our faith. We'll be exploring concepts like reverence, awe, and the fear of the Lord, topics that can be challenging but are incredibly enriching for our spiritual journey. Now, speaking of heart tugging, we've got something truly special lined up for you. We're going to explore a brand new release called The Fear of God by FC Music. This song is packed with powerful lyrics that dive into reverence, awe, and the fear of the Lord, something that I have personally been learning about as I go through our community study plan. Now, I'm really excited to unpack these themes because they beautifully align with what I've been learning in Genesis and John 1, 1 through 5. Before we take a deep dive into the analysis, let's take a moment to prepare ourselves. If you're at home, grab a Bible, a pen, and a notebook, because I'm going to be throwing a lot of scriptures at you. And make yourself a nice cup of coffee or tea. Find a cozy corner where you can just settle in and focus. Now, if you're on the go, perhaps on your daily commute or on a run, try to put away any distractions and create a space in your heart where the Holy Spirit can speak to you. Let's start our time together in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we embark on this journey to understand the fear and wisdom of God, we invite your Holy Spirit to align our hearts with yours. Open our hearts our minds, and our spirits to receive the truths that you have for us today. We ask for your guidance and illumination as we dive deeper into your word and explore the profound theme of reverence, awe, and fear of you. Holy Spirit, we ask that you remove any distractions or barriers that might hinder our understanding. Fill us with your presence that we might fully grasp the depth and breadth of your wisdom and love. Let your truth penetrate our hearts, transforming us and drawing us closer to you. Oh Lord, we submit this time to you. And we acknowledge that without your spirit, our efforts are in vain. So lead us in spirit and in truth and help us to apply what we learn today to our daily lives. May this time of study not only increase our knowledge, but also deepen our relationship with you and strengthen our faith. We ask all this in your mighty name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, now let's listen to the whole song in its entirety. This is different what we do from our normal podcast, but I want you to pay close attention to the lyrics and let them resonate with you and be drawn into the entirety of the message.
Absolutely beautiful. Now, if you've listened to my podcast before, you know I'm on the worship team at my church. And we have applications out there that include not only the tracks that we'll be singing on the weekend, but also new releases that are coming up. And this came in the new music list, and it grabbed me because it was not something that we normally talk about in worship music. And considering what we've been learning in Genesis 1 through 11, how the creation of the world was and the omnipresence and the sovereignty of God, I had to do this song. I had to jump in, not only for you, my dear listeners, but also for myself, because I've been getting this reverence and this awe of God that I never had before by starting from Genesis and studying all the way to Revelations. So now that we've immersed ourselves in the beautiful melody and powerful lyrics of this song, let's start unpacking and we'll start with the first verse. It says, reverential awe, fear of God, may we stand and behold the glory of your divinity. Now let's begin by understanding what reverential awe means in the context of our relationship with God. Reverential awe is a profound respect and wonder inspired by the majesty and holiness of God. Now, it's more than just admiration. It's a recognition of his supreme authority and purity. Proverbs 1.7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and and instruction. Now, I've thematically verse mapped before, and it is profound what we found when we searched into this scripture. And it tells us that true wisdom starts with a proper understanding of who God is, a deep, reverential fear of his power and holiness. The Hebrew word for fear here is yirah, which means a sense of awe and profound respect mixed with fear. Now, this fear is not about being scared, but recognizing God's supreme authority and holiness. Now, I have a personal experience that kind of might bring this into context. We have summer storms here in Indiana. I'm not used to the summer storms that they have here yet. I'm from the West Coast. So on the way home from work, there was this big lightning storm happening all around us. And one lightning strike struck the ground not 20, 30 feet from me. And the reverence and power 
and fear of the ability of what that lightning strike could do to me in my car woke me up and made me hyper aware and made me, first of all, pray. And second of all, I was in fear, but reverence and awe of the power of that lightning strike. I had never been so close to a lightning strike before. That is not unlike a little bit of what we're talking about here. Now, the term knowledge, dot, in Hebrew signifies not just intellectual understanding, but experiential and relational knowing. Therefore, fearing the Lord is foundational because it positions us rightly before God, opening our hearts to receive His wisdom. Now, this dynamic relationship between Yara and Da'at is seen throughout the wisdom literature, emphasizing that true wisdom is both a divine gift and a pursuit of a righteous life. Now, I'm in the story of Noah, and I cannot forget where God says, and favor fell upon Noah, and Noah lived a righteous life before God. And I realize that that has to do with the fear of the Lord, that regardless of the culture that was happening around him, he heard God, he found favor with God, it was a divine gift from God, and he followed God's voice no matter how crazy what God was telling him sounded. Now, similarly, in Proverbs 9, verse 10 states, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So again, we see that wisdom is rooted in our recognition of God's awesome nature. Now, Isaiah 6, verses 1 through 5, is a vivid depiction of this awe. Now, let me go into the story a little bit. It will give you some context. Isaiah describes his vision as, In the year the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king the Lord Almighty. Isaiah's reaction to God's holiness, his overwhelming sense of unworthiness and fear captures the essence of this reverential awe. Imagine being in a place of such power that it made you feel your humanity. That's where Isaiah was. It's a recognition of God's absolute purity compared to his own sinfulness. Now, let's discuss the difference between reverential fear and terror. And the reason I'm going into this is because actually one of the meanings of the Hebrew word yura is terror, but it depends on how the word is being used. So in Exodus 20 verses 18 through 21, It provides a useful context and contrast to understand this a little bit more. Now, after God gives the Ten Commandments, the Israelites are terrified by the thunder and lightning, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain and smoke. Sound familiar? Very similar to what Isaiah experienced. Now, they tell Moses, because they cannot handle this presence, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. Now, Moses, who just spent the last few days in the presence of God, responds kindly and gently as he could. He says, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you 
to keep you from sinning. Now here, do not be afraid addresses their terror, their immediate overwhelming fear of what they witnessed. But the fear of God refers to a lasting reverential awe meant to keep them righteous. Why? Because they had just spent 300 years in captivity of a great nation of Egypt, and he was trying to show how much more powerful Yahweh was in comparison to what they were just broken free from. Now, in Psalm 33, verse 8, it encourages us, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. Now, this verse invites us to acknowledge God's majesty with reverence, not terror. In Psalm 111, verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who follow his precepts have good understanding. To him belongs eternal praise. Reverential fear here is associated with wisdom and understanding, a positive and profound respect. Now, in Revelations 4, verse 8, it takes us to the heavenly throne room, where the four living creatures never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Now, if you notice, the beginning of that verse is very similar to the verse described in Isaiah 6. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God. God Almighty. This reverential fear is contrasted with the command, do not be afraid, often spoken by angels and by God himself through scriptures when addressing his people. For example, in Luke 2 verse 10, the angel tells the shepherds, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Imagine how terrified the shepherds were to have this angelic being and a host of them all showing up to proclaim the birth of Jesus. Not only was there just one angel, there was a host of angels coming at these shepherds to proclaim the coming king. I would be scared too. But the angel calms their initial terror to open their hearts to the joyous message of Christ's birth. In Isaiah 41 verse 10, God says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Now this reassurance speaks against terror and emphasizes God's protective presence. So the reverential fear of God, the beginning of wisdom, is a deep respect and awe that acknowledges his holiness, power, and glory. It's not about being terrified of God, but about having a profound respect for his greatness and living in a way that honors him. Now, as we reflect on these lyrics, Let's carry with us the understanding that this reverential fear draws us closer to God, leading us to wisdom and a deeper relationship with Him. Let's take a moment to let this truth settle in as we prepare to dive deeper into the song. Okay, my friends, we have unpacked the profound reverential awe and fear of the Lord in the first verse. So now let's move on to the chorus, which is equally as powerful. It says, Holy One, have my life. I was made to adore you. I was made to behold you. Holy One, have my song. I was made to adore you. I was made to behold you. Now these lines speak to total surrender and the purpose of adoration. Now let's explore what it means to offer our lives completely to God And look at some scriptural examples of total surrender, from the simple to the complex. First, let's start with a foundational scripture on surrender. Romans 12 verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. 
This is your true and proper worship. Now here, Paul calls us to present our entire lives as a living sacrifice, emphasizing that true worship is about giving all of ourselves to God because we're made for him. One simple, profound, and well-known example of this surrender is Mary's acceptance of God's plan that is presented to her by the angel Gabriel. Remember, he also starts with, fear not. But let's focus in on Luke 1, verse 38, that records her response. She says, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Now, Mary's willingness to accept God's plan without fully understanding it shows deep faith and obedience, especially considering the condition she was in. She was newly betrothed. She is not supposed to be with any person until their marriage, and she ends up pregnant with God's son. There was a lot of controversy in God's plan. But she laid down her life. She completely surrendered. Now let's go to Galatians 2.20 because it provides a personal testament of this surrender. Because it says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now here, Paul's declaration shows a complete identity transformation through surrender, living by faith in Christ. A man who was once a powerful Pharisee that was hunting down Christians had such a radical transformation. Face to face with Jesus said it turned his faith around and he surrendered all. There's another example in Mark 12, verse 41 through 44 called the widow's offering. And it's another beautiful illustration of simple yet profound and total surrender. Now, Jesus observed the people putting money into the temple treasury, noting many rich people threw in large amounts. But a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few cents. Jesus himself highlighted her act of giving all she had saying, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on. The widow's offering represents a simple but complete act of surrender and trust in God's provision. Now let's move on to more complex examples. Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac is one of the most profound acts of total surrender. In Genesis 22, 1 through 14, God tested Abraham by asking him to sacrifice his son Isaac. Now, despite the enormous emotional and spiritual weight of this request, Abraham obeyed, showing his total trust and surrender to God's will. At the last moment, God provided a ram as a substitute, but Abraham's willingness to obey is a profound example of complex and complete surrender. Another ultimate example of total surrender is Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. Matthew 26 verse 39 records, Going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father... If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Facing the crucifixion, Jesus submitted completely to the Father's will, showing the depth of his obedience and love. Now, these examples from Mary's simple acceptance of God's plan to Jesus' ultimate sacrifice illustrate what I mean to say, Holy One, have my life. They show us that true adoration and worship go beyond words and songs. They involve a complete and total surrender to God's will. So as we sing, I was made to adore you, 
I was made to behold you, we are reminded that our primary purpose is to worship and behold God in all his glory. And this chorus is a call to live out our created purpose, offering our lives as living sacrifices, just as Romans 12 verse 1 encourages us to do. Now, this verse calls us to genuine repentance and a life that pleases God, not just through words, but through our actions. Now, before we dive a little deeper, I want to remind you that this podcast came with a mature audience only warning. What we're going to discuss further is a journey from the old life to the new life in Christ. And it's profound, but very challenging touching on areas where many Christians really struggle, including myself. Now, it's a subject that really requires spiritual maturity, but it is deeply enriching and something I do not want to overlook. So first, let's revisit Exodus 20, verse 20, where Moses says to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Now, this passage highlights the purpose of the fear of God to lead us away from sin and toward a life that pleases him. In Proverbs 8, verse 13, it states, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Here, the fear of the Lord is associated with a deep aversion to sin and a commitment to living righteously. Isaiah 55 verse 7 calls us to repentance. It says, Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. This passage emphasizes God's mercy and willingness to forgive when we turn away from our sinful ways. Now let's focus on our key scripture for this entire podcast. It is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 14 through 16, and it states, As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Now the call to holiness in this scripture is deeply rooted in the Old Testament, particularly Leviticus 19.2, where God commands the Israelites to be holy because he is holy. Now the Greek word for holy is hagios, and it implies being set apart and dedicated to God's service. This holiness is not just moral purity, but a distinctiveness that reflects God's character. Peter's audience, primarily Gentile Christians, were reminded that their new identity in Christ calls them to live differently from their past pagan practices. Now, this transformative process, known as sanctification, is both instantaneous in our justification in Christ, and ongoing as we grow in becoming more and more like Christ. Now, this dual aspect of holiness underscores the necessity of relying on the Holy Spirit to empower us to live in a way that pleases God. This scripture is a call to move from our old life, marked by sin and ignorance, to a new life of holiness and obedience to God. It's a journey of transformation, and it is not easy. The first part of this journey is recognizing and turning away from our old life. Ephesians 4 verses 22 through 24 tells us, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This is also reflected in Romans 12 verse 2, which encourages us 
Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. One of the most powerful stories of transformation amongst all of the other ones that are in there is the not so well-known story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Now, Zacchaeus was a man deeply entrenched in his old life of greed and deceit. But an encounter with Jesus changed everything. He responded, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Zacchaeus's story is a vivid illustration of repentance and the move from an old sinful life to a new life of obedience and generosity. His transformation was immediate and radical, showing us that the genuine repentance involves not just words, but actions that reflect our new life in Christ. However, the journey from the old life to the new is fraught with challenges and pitfalls. One of the biggest pitfalls is the temptation to return to old habits. 2 Peter 2 verses 20 through 22 warns us, If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. Check that out. It is better for you to have stayed into the old entanglement of sin than being transformed and go back to it. Another pitfall is complacency. It's easy to become comfortable and stop growing in our faith. Revelations 3 verses 15 through 16 addresses this. It says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now let's turn to one of the most famous people in the Bible, King David. Now King David's life is a complex tapestry of highs and lows, victories and failures. After his sin with Bathsheba, David was confronted by the prophet Nathan and deeply repented. Psalm 51 is David's heartfelt prayer of repentance, where he says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David's story teaches us that even when we fall, repentance and a desire to return to holiness can restore our relationship with God. Now, remaining holy as God is holy requires ongoing commitment and dependence on the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5 verse 16 through 17 says, so I say, walk with the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. Well, 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 7 through 8 also reminds us, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you his Holy Spirit. There's a lot of severe warnings of going back to sin and temptation once you are submitting yourself to the presence and the holiness of God. And Daniel is a prime example of someone who remained holy despite immense pressure to conform. When taken to Babylon, Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. Daniel 1.8 says, But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself in any way. 
Even when faced with the threat of the lion's den, Daniel remained steadfast in his faith. The king's administrators were so jealous of Daniel that he tricked the king into a decree stating that their people could not pray to any god other than King Darius. But Daniel did not give in. In Daniel 6.10, it says, Now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened towards Jerusalem. And three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to God, just as he had done before. Now, God used him as a huge example to that king. But he did not waver, not once. So how are we supposed to remain holy? The first is stay connected to God. Regular prayer and reading of God's word helps us to connect to God's will and strengthen our resolve to live holy lives. Psalm 119 verse 9 through 11 says, How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all of my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Staying connected to God through regular prayer and scripture reading is foundational for holiness. Consider the life of Daniel, who prayed three times a day despite the threat of persecution. His commitment to prayer sustained his faith and integrity in a foreign land. The second is to seek accountability. Surround yourself with fellow believers who can encourage and challenge you. Hebrews 10 verses 24 through 25 encourages us, And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Accountability was a vital part of the early Christian community. Paul often traveled with his companions like Barnabas, Silas, and Timothy, who provided mutual support and encouragement. You can read more about that in Acts 13, verses 2 through 3. The third thing we can do is depend on the Holy Spirit. It is by the Holy Spirit's power that we can resist sin and live holy lives. Ephesians 3.16 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit empowers believers to live according to God's will. In Galatians 5.22-23, Paul describes the fruit of the Spirit, which are characteristics of a holy life. Yielding to the Spirit's guidance transforms our character and actions. And the fourth thing we can do is live in obedience. Obedience to God's commands is a vital aspect of holiness. John chapter 14 verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commands. Now obedience is not about legalism but about living in a way that pleases God and reflects his holiness. Jesus' obedience to the Father, even to the point of death on the cross, as seen in Philippians 2.8, serves as the ultimate example. Now, in summary, 1 Peter 1.14-16 calls us to move from our old lives of sin to new lives of holiness. This transformation requires repentance, ongoing commitment, and dependence on God as we strive to live lives that please Him. Let's remember that He who called us is holy, and we are to be holy in all we do. Reflect on these lyrics again. May we turn from sin and please you with our lives, not just lips. Let this be our prayer and commitment as we seek to live holy lives that honor God. Now, like I said, this podcast was for the spiritually mature. And it's speaking to me. And there are areas in my life that I need to correct and get in alignment with God. 
So let, as we wrap up our deep dive into this song, let's take some time for some personal reflection. And I encourage you to pause the podcast and think about each of these questions deeply and feel free to jot down your thoughts in a journal or a notebook, or you could just text them in your iPhone app. Okay, first question. How do you personally experience the fear of the Lord in your daily life? Second question, in what ways can you turn from sin, otherwise known as the desires of your flesh that is contrary to God, and live a life that pleases God beyond just words? Final question, how does the concept of God's glory filling the temple impact your understanding of his presence in your life. Now, I know these questions are challenging and deep. So take your time to ponder them and let the Holy Spirit guide your thoughts and your next actions moving forward. As always, let's close our time together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in reverence and awe, recognizing your supreme holiness and majesty. Today we've explored what it means to fear you, to revere you, and to walk in your holiness. Thank you for showing us through your word that the fear of you is the beginning of wisdom. And we need your help to internalize this truth deeply letting it guide our lives. Guard us against the temptation to return to any old habit and keep us from becoming complacent in our faith. Like David, we seek your forgiveness and ask for pure hearts and steadfast spirits. We pray that you will restore the joy of your salvation within us. Teach us to walk by your spirit, just as Galatians reminded us, so we do not gratify the desires of our flesh. Empower us with your Holy Spirit to resist the temptation of sin and live in a way that pleases you. Lord, open the eyes of our hearts so we may see and know you better and understand the hope to which you have called us. Transform us from glory to glory as we behold your majesty. Surround us with fellow believers who will spur us on towards love and good deeds. May we encourage one another and remain committed to living lives that reflect your holiness. We pray all of this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Wow, I needed to hear this as much as you. So I just wanted to thank you for braving with me on this spiritual journey through the fear of God by FC Music. And though it's sobering, I hope that this time has given you a deeper connection to the concepts in the lyrics and a richer understanding of the God we serve. Our worship becomes so much more meaningful when we understand the scriptural depths behind the words that we're singing, don't you think? And as always, if you want to go even deeper with this podcast, there is a devotional with all of the scripture, biblical questions, and reflection questions on the devotional section of our website. And if you want to join us into even further study, every Thursday night, we have thematic verse mapping at 8 p.m. Eastern time, live on our YouTube channel and our Facebook group. You can also join us on our community study plan. We're finishing up Genesis 1 through 11 this month and about to dive into Job next. The revelations we have been getting through this study has been nothing short of amazing. You can find more information about the community study blog on our blog at www.lyricandletter.com forward slash blog, and then scroll down to the post that says Community Study Plan. Until next time, I pray that you will keep worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth, stay in God's word, keeping your heart aligned with him. May you have a beautiful day in the Lord. God bless.